And in particular, the thing I want to think about is um, the extent to which uh, things have changed and things have stayed the same, um, often at the same time. Um, and, oh, I forgot to introduce my research assistant, my research dog, this is Tessa. Um, I'm sure some of you are into mixed methods or randomised controlled trials, but the latest technology is the research dog. <laughs> <laughs> and this, this is by far the most sophisticated development in, in research methods for a long time. If you want to do good research, you need a research dog, and, and Tessa is, um, is an excellent research dog. Um, the other interesting thing generally about micropolitics at school is, is that um, uh, Spanish-speaking uh, readers, both in, in Spain and Latin America, seem to have a particular interest in the book. And, and it, it still sells quite extensively, particularly in Latin America. Um, and I think there are, are reasons for that, which again I'll, I'll try and, and talk about in a moment. Um, so it's possible to find uh, uh, PowerPoint share sites, Latin American ones. Uh, there are several of them which, which go through the micropolitics of the school, which, which was very helpful when I was trying to think about it again uh, after, after such a long time. Um, the, other, the other point about the book, rereading it now, is, is that interestingly I can see traces, I mean they are only traces, anticipations of of some of my, my more recent work and my current work. Uh, I was surprised by that, the extent to which I could find them, although of course it may be that I'm, I'm reading them into the text, maybe at the time uh, they weren't uh, very clear at all in my own mind. I originally wrote the book because I was teaching a, a master's uh, programme, the University of Sussex, and each year we, we used to have 12 seconded senior teachers paid for by their municipalities, their local authorities. And there were another 24 who did a, a curriculum master's degree. That in itself is now unheard of, uh, certainly in the UK. There are no local authorities who will pay for their teachers to spend a year studying a master's course. But at that time, it wasn't unusual at all. It was considered normal, and it's indicative of a number of things I'm, I'm going to go on to say. But when I started planning and writing the course on the, this, this particular program was on schools as organisations, I, I began to, to look at the literature and basically there wasn't any. Or, or that which there was, uh, was, was very um, uh, uh, formalistic, very uh, structural. Um, it had little relationship to my understanding of what schools were actually like, and certainly <coughs> nothing like the school that I concentrated on in the research for my own PhD. Um, these were very neat uh, structural administrative accounts of how schools were supposed to work in some kind of ideal world. Uh, and, and they were far removed from the messy, conflictual, difficult, uh, uncertain, unstable world um, of the schools that I was, I was working in. So rather than drawing upon those, I mean, there, there, there was some, some older work that was interesting, which is now um, almost totally neglected. The work of Dan Lorty, for instance, on school teaching in the 1950s, I think, or even uh, um, 40s, 40s. Uh, Harry Walcott's work, The Man in the Principal's Office, which was an ethnography of a, a, a school head teacher, a school principal, uh, also written in the 50s. Charles Bid Bidwell, who was an organisational theorist. And Harold and, uh, and Burlach's work, The Dilemmas of Schooling, still a, a book of enormous relevance, but no, nobody reads it anymore. I'm sure they, they've never heard of it. But if you read it, you will find it uh, an extraordinary book. And in England, there were, there were a couple of people writing about the schools organisations, Eric Hoyle and Ronald King. But with all of that, I, I, and, and more formal organisational theory or organisational research in schools, I found little that was of use. So I, I turned more to political science, and I, I used quite a bit of political science um, in the book. Um, but also I tried to, to generate a conceptual framework around the idea of the micro-politics of the school. Uh, so I was trying to write in many ways against the existing literature, 
to, to write in a different way, uh, to develop a, a, a different repertoire of concepts and, and theoretical possibilities for thinking about this goal. Um, and one of the things I did uh, in relation to that was I drew extensively on uh, ethnographies of schools. So rather than accounts of schools that were focused on organisation per se, I drew on ethnographies that, that had sidelights, if you like, or uh, that focused on the underlife of the institution in order to try and understand, uh, understand them as micro-political organisations. Um, one of the other things that struck me just in passing, uh, looking back at the book, which I was very pleased about, is there's lots and lots of that gender in it. Um, which was totally unrepresented in any of the literature about school organisations at the time. Uh, so again, I was trying to, to think in a different way about uh, schools as organisations, and, and, and gender seemed to be an important dimension. There are other things that now we might see as significant that, that aren't there, that weren't part of the way I was thinking about schools or anybody else was at the time. And again, just in passing, I should mention that, that um, one of the people who took up the idea of micropolitics was a, a, an American um, researcher, Joe Blaze, who then went on to write a series of books about the micropolitics of the school. I meant to check what, what um, Joe is up to now. I haven't, I haven't talked to him for about 20 years now. Um, <coughs> But the most important thing in making sense of the book, I think, is that it, it lies on a point of epistemic shift in the nature of schooling. Uh, an ep epistemic shift which was which taking place um, very immediately in England, but then had ramifications and still continues to have ramifications for systems around the world. And if you like, this was an epistemic shift from a welfare state model of schooling to a neoliberal model of schooling. Um, and, and in many ways, that shift and the, the epistemological changes and ontological changes, in many ways, that, that, that go with it, have overtaken almost <coughs> everything in the book. Um, so what it means to teach and learn, what it means to be a teacher, what it, what it means to be a school, in effect, is now different. The school that is in the micropolitics of the school is not the same as the <coughs> social phenomenon that we now describe as, as the school. Um, it, it has changed profoundly in, in almost every respect. Not just in the sense of uh, changes in curriculum, changes in assessment, changes in pedagogy, although those are significant, but more profoundly, changes in the nature of school subjects. I don't mean disciplines, I mean people, I mean actors. So changes in the nature of the teacher subject, changes in the nature of the student subject, changes in the nature of the, the head teacher or director or principal subject, which, which I'll come back to. So I want to say something about that epistemic shift and the before and after. And also I want, I want to talk about the episteme, the epistemic in another sense as well, which is something I've been thinking about, um, playing with, if you like, an idea, toying with, uh, which may have some relevance. Uh, and this shift, of course, this epistemic shift was not simply related to what's going on in education, it was actually related to what was going on everywhere, certainly across all aspects of policy, social, economic policy, changes in the nature of sta the state, um, changes in the nature of, of politics itself. And this was animated, uh, represented to a great extent by Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan in the United States. This was the shift towards our, our neo, or the first move towards our neoliberal present. So this, this change in the nature of the school is situated in this broader context of changes in the dominant political rationality and everything that went with it. And of course this, this one aspect of that was profound changes in the nature of the welfare state and how the welfare state was structured and perceived uh, and experienced uh, by its, uh, its participants. And there's another relationship uh, to this shift which has a particular relevance in, in England. Um, 
and gets neglected uh, very often in, in accounts of the, the sort of recent history of education, but is enormously important. In the period between 1985 and 1987, there was an extended, a protracted, and very conflictual uh, industrial dispute between teachers and the government. Uh, and a series of teacher strikes, uh, where, whereby schools were closed down for periods of time. Teachers went on strike. This was very widely supported, had an enormous impact as, as an industrial dispute. Um, uh, and, but eventually it, it failed in the sense that the teachers did not get their demands and they went back to work. And that produced a massive change in the capacity of teachers to act as uh, union entities or as, as union members. Um, and it gave enormous uh, additional uh, power, if you like, to, to the Secretary of State for Education. And the Secretary of State for Education at this time was a man called Keith Joseph. Uh, and again, he is significant in a more general sense. Keith Joseph is generally regarded as the man responsible <coughs> for educating Margaret Thatcher in the ways of neoliberalism. He was her mentor. He was uh, a member of the Mont Pelerin Society. Do people know about the Mont Pelerin Society? No. Society founded in 1947 in the Hotel Mont Pelerin in Switzerland to uh, explore, discuss and uh, disseminate the ideas of Frederick von Hayek. Hayekian economics, neoliberal mm. economics. Mm. And members of the Mont Pelerin Society still exist today. It has extensive membership. It has regional groups. It meets. And they're still committed to disseminating the ideas within political uh, ar arenas of the, the work of Frederick von Hayek and more generally neoliberalism. And Keith Joseph was a member from, uh, from the 1950s and he played a key role in the Conservative Party in in bringing about a move to what was called the New Right and um, uh, 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 influencing Margaret Thatcher in, in very profound ways. Um, but at this point, until 1987, he was Secretary of State for Education. Um, and what, what happened at this point with the strike um, and the conflict between teachers and the government was, was a, a crisis in education. Or, or the, the uh, particular point of crisis. The crisis, in a sense, had been developed and manufactured over a period of time, in particular around the idea of um, both unaccountable teachers, unaccountable for their practice, and <coughs> politicised teachers, teachers who were uh, using political ideas through and in or to organise their teaching practice in schools. I mean, in real terms, you could probably count the number of teachers doing that in any explicit way on, on the fingers of both hands. But as a general view of teachers and what was happening to teachers, it became a very uh, significant uh, aspect of, of political currency in the relationship between government and teachers and in the way in which government was able to change the way that parents thought about teachers. And that there, were, there were a number of cause celebra um, in particular schools which were um, which fed into this uh, crisis uh, around the teacher um, and what this crisis did together with the strike was was to create a moment of expediency and immediacy the idea that schooling was in crisis teachers could no longer be trusted and something had to be done so this was this was this was a crisis, not of a, a temporal nature, but of a uh, sorry, not of a, a, a territorial nature, but a, a, a temporal uh, nature, as Spandering puts it in writing about crisis. Um, crisis was represented as a, a, a moment of failure. The school system is failing. Students are not learning. Teachers are out of control. Schools are ineffective. Um, there was an imperative to act, something that, that had to be done, and what Matthew Clark calls an imperative modality. And the imperative um, was focused, had its focus in, um, in England uh, around the 1988 Education Reform Act. 
And, and this reformed almost every aspect of education, or began those reforms. Um, and it became, the, it, it now stands as the key marker in this shift from the welfare model of schooling to the neoliberal model of schooling. Uh, and I wrote a book about that too, um, called Politics and Policymaking in Education, which was focused explicitly on the 1988, 1988 Education Reform Act. And I interviewed 55 key political actors who were involved in different ways in the formulation or the background or the influence over uh, this act. And one of the people I interviewed with was Keith Joseph at the time. Uh, fascinating interview, very strange man in many ways. Um, and when I asked him, I said to him, during your time as Secretary of State, what do you think was your greatest achievement? I, always, I remember now, um, he put his head in his hands, he said, nothing, nothing at all. Nothing, I achieved nothing. <coughs> and I said, well, there must be something. I mean, it was a period of uh, enormous change in education. He said, well, I suppose, if anything, I, what, if I look back, the one thing I might be proud of is bringing the idea of bankruptcy into education. And what he was signalling, what he meant was the market model. And he also said in, in, um, in the interview, speaking as a card-carrying Hayekian, a card-carrying neoliberal, we have a bloody state system. I wish we hadn't got it. He doesn't want state education. He didn't want it. The neoliberal model is everybody fends for themselves in terms of finding the education they need. I wish we had taken a different route in 1870. So he was regretting the creation of the, of the, the state system. Uh, we've got the ruddy state involved. I don't want it. I don't think we know how to do it. I certainly don't think Secretaries of State know anything about it. But we're landed with it. If we could go back to 1870, I would go to a different route. We've got compulsory education, which is responsibility of hideous, hideous importance. And we tyrannise children to do that which they don't want, and we don't produce results. This is, this is classic neoliberal Hayekian stuff, the idea that children should not be forced to go to school by the state, that the parents should have the responsibility for uh, educating their children, and if they see fit that they should go to a school, they should organise it and pay for it. And this became the precursor for education policy as we live it now. What he was saying was, uh, we need to reduce state control over education, we need to give parents choice, we need to introduce a multi multiplicity of providers, we need privatisation, we need uh, greater autonomy, we need competition. All of the uh, technologies of neoliberalism, they are all anticipated or all represented uh, in what Keith Joseph was, was talking about here um, in, in, in this uh, interview. Um, and so the, 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 the model he was articulating is, is again, in Hayekian terms, the end of partisan politics. So, so government, obviously in many ways in practice it doesn't work out like this, but his argument was that, that government should not make partisan decisions about the education system. Uh, those decisions should be made by the market, by the hidden hand of the market in Adam Smith's terms. And that rather than looking for partisan or ideological solutions to educational problems, we should look for, for technical solutions. And that again really represents or speaks to our current present in education. The other uh, aspect of all this I want to draw attention to, and, and one of the key changes in the, the, the pre micropolitic post micropolitic shift, is, is that the Micropolitics of the School, the book, explores teachers' ideological and normative engagement with education as a problem, and disputes within schools about what education looks like. Those disputes are now regarded as inappropriate and not something that teachers should concern themselves with. And to a great extent, those solutions and debates are represented or embedded within technical solutions to schooling which are articulated by experts of various kinds. So in this sense there's a process of depoliticization 
I mean, in another sense, it's a re-politicisation, but depoliticisation in an explicit sense. So as Matthew Clark puts it, uh, public policy based on the economic inevitability appears to be above politics, while simultaneously facilitating the political project of increasing the penetration and entrenchment of market modalities in all domains of society by interweaving ideological prescriptions with factual explanations. Uh, it comes from, a, I, I think, a very good paper by Matthew Clark uh, on deep politicisation published in, um, <coughs> in, in 2012. Um, so what, what this means is that, that politics are now, um, and the political nature of decision making, are placed uh, at one remove uh, from the immediacy of, of school life. Um, and a new set of um, depoliticised truths uh, about schooling are used to um, articulate uh, and make intelligible uh, and make um, uh, organised, provide the organisational basis uh, for what we now talk about uh, as schooling. Um, and it, it, it articulates also a new uh, approach to statecraft uh, in which uh, governments are allowed to present policies as inevitable and necessary in technical terms rather than discretionary and deliberate in political terms. Um, so the micropolitics of the school, as it says on page 279, schools, it says, are sites of ideological struggle. I think that the common generalisation now would be that sites are no longer sites, schools are no longer sites uh, of uh, ideological struggle. Uh, and there's a denial of uh, political choice um, at the level of schooling. Rather, as I've said already, there's the articulation of this, these discourses of inevitability, of expertise, of necessity. So now we look, we look for guidance from the OECD, um, from the World Bank. Uh, from uh, think tanks, from uh, policy entrepreneurs of various kinds, the Michael Fullans uh, of this world and, and others of his ilk. Uh, um, they, now, they, they now carry and articulate uh, the key truths uh, about education. And they, they contribute to this reworking of the political as technical and hollowing out the political nature of uh, of policy making, at least at the explicit uh, level. Um, and to a great extent, of course, the, the, they are unaccountable. Um, they have no political accountability. Uh, rather, they have a fiscal accountability because they're, they're, they're paid. Um, they're now bought in to do political work and to do policy work. There's now an enormous market in policy work which is which is taken up by the private sector much more than we know unless you look closely um, the key the key policy global policy actors in many ways currently uh, uh, are um, uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers uh, KPMG um, um, I think of the other two um, 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 McKinsey. Accenture and McKinsey, McKinsey. And McKinsey would, yeah. uh, they are involved in, in key policy work uh, in almost every developed country around the world. Uh, they do consultation work, uh, they write policy documents, they do consultations, they make recommendations, they do evaluations, their employees sit on uh, key committees, they give advice, um, they are key actors in, in, in the policy environment. Um, again, almost non-existent in the part in, in the period uh, before the micro uh, politics of the school, and in all of this, and this comes to the, the second aspect of or use of the idea of episteme. Um, there's a displacement whereby. Um, the voice of policy is now shifted to, to these, these technocrats of various kinds. And teachers, um, teachers are silenced. Uh, teachers are no longer um, valid, uh, no longer have a valid voice 
uh, within education policy. <coughs> they are no longer able to speak about education. They are no longer trusted to have a view of education, uh, at least not a view that, that anybody would take seriously and, and, and seek to act upon. Um, in this sense, in a classic way, the, the what you might call the professionalised teacher of micropolitics of the school has been deprofessionalised. Their voice has been removed, and then reprofessionalised as as technocrats. Um, that their their practice is now articulated in terms of a set of technical skills, rather than um, a reflective moral and political practice. So that they're no longer viewed as being able to make judgments about their practice based upon moral principles and reflection, they are now expected to implement or enact uh, technical procedures which have been formulated elsewhere, either by experts of various <coughs> kinds or as defined by um, randomised controlled trials which can demonstrate an effect of a certain intervention in relation to pupil performance at an appropriate cost. And certainly in, in England, this is, this is now how the uh, English Department for Education spends the overwhelming majority of its research money funding uh, randomised controlled trials which are used to evaluate interventions which are aimed at raising pupil performance. And there is a, a website um, which uh, teachers are encouraged to look at which rate um, these interventions on two dimensions. One is effectiveness in terms of the extent to which they achieve improvements in pupil performance. There aren't any other considerations. And the other one is how much they cost. Uh, and so the expertise of teachers is to choose among these in relation to effectiveness and cost. Not to reflect upon whether they're worthwhile or, or purposeful or valid or have any um, usefulness in terms of the education of the whole child. All of those considerations have been displaced by these uh, technical and fiscal decisions. And we might think about this, we might think about this as a form of what Fricka calls epistemic injustice. That teachers are now subjects of epistemic injustice. I mean, she uses this to think about um, uh, marginalised social groups of various kinds. But I, I think with, with a degree of, of latitude, you can also think about it uh, in relation to what's happened as, as teachers. Teachers are now marginalised subjects in many ways. They're, they're technicised. Uh, subjects in the way that I've described. And, and Fricka talks about epistemic injustice um, having two dimensions. One she calls testimonial injust injustice. And she says this happens when prejudice causes a hearer to give a deflated level of credibility to a speaker's word. Well, that would define the way in which most people, certainly politicians and to some extent parents, have come to think about teachers. That, that they're not worth listening to, um, that, that, that they can't be trusted. There's a loss of trust um, in the teacher. So you don't have any to give credibility to the, to the things they say. And the second is, is what she calls, what Fricka calls uh, hermeneutic injustice. Um, and this is, as she says, a prior stage when a gap in collective interpretive resources puts someone at an unfair disadvantage when it comes to making sense of their social experiences. Well, in this sense, the change in the nature of, of um, the school as a, a, an epistemic structure and the, the subjects uh, articulated, uh, produced within it, mean that, in, in a sense, the, the, the teacher is not credible in a discursive uh, sense, that the that the school is organised around a, a set of principles which are driven by the market and by the, um, the structural and ideological procedures of the market. The school is essentially a molecular um, form of capital. It's a firm, it's a business. 
Uh, it, has, it has a budget which it's responsible for, it employs its teachers, it competes with other schools on the basis of parental choice, it must make decisions about who it employs on the basis the budget has available. If it gets into financial difficulties, Keith Joseph would argue that it should go bankrupt and go out of business. Of course, often governments um, will step in and, and, and support schools in that way. Um, but at the moment, that again describes the presence of education in England. There is, there is a, a financial crisis in schooling. Uh, we've got uh, more students uh, and uh, less money um, for schools, or the same money and less students. Um, and schools are having to make very difficult decisions about um, who they employ, how many teachers they employ, what kind of teachers they employ, where they can employ teachers at all. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment uh, when I finish. Um, so in all of this, in, in, the, in the discursive structure of schooling, there's no space for the teacher as a political subject. They're not recognisable. The, the, the grid of intelligibility within uh, the contemporary school does not recognise the teacher as, a, as an ideological or political subject. It recognises them solely as a, a, a technocratic subject. And it incorporates them into its market procedures, both in terms of employment relations and in a more pointed and direct sense through um, uh, payment by results, uh, through performance-related pay. And according to latest OECD research, there are almost 30 countries now in OECD countries that have some form or elements of performance-related pay for teachers. Some um, more marginal, some very thoroughgoing. Israel is one of those which has a very thoroughgoing system um, of payment by results. So in this sense, the teacher is an ideological subject becomes a discursive impossibility. We just can't think of them in that way. So when I read the micropolitics of the school, in, in many ways it doesn't make sense. That's a way of thinking about teachers. It doesn't make sense anymore. Not, it doesn't, it's not discursively sensible for thinking about teachers. Um, so this is, this is a remaking of the teacher in, in, in the centre of all this, together with many other changes. Um, so the experience of meaning of being a teacher, of teaching, of learning, uh, what it means to be educated, all, all of these things are, are discursively reworked. And as I said earlier, the experience of meaning of being, uh, meaning of being or doing head teaching or school leadership, as we now talk about it. I noticed, I was surprised in the book, that I actually talked about it as school leadership. Um, but what, what I meant by it is, is what we... Oh, sorry. Is not... Is not... She, she doesn't like school leadership. <laughs> Very distressing. <laughs> it's all right, there aren't any school leaders here. Um, school leadership is, is, is now uh, has it, it, its own discipline. Uh, there is a discipline of school leadership. You can do master's degrees and PhDs in school leadership. Strange notion. Uh, it has its own concepts, it has its own literature, it has its own journals. It, in a sense, it has its own savoir, uh, which, which can be used to think about who a principal is and their relationship to uh, the school. Um, and this is not, of course, unrelated to the, to the nature of the reform process, in as much that head teachers, leaders, have become key actors in the process of education reform. They've become conduits uh, in the reform process. Uh, they they have, have, in some respects, been the beneficiaries of reform, certainly in a financial sense. Certainly in the UK they have. So according to Times Education Supplement now, the standard starting pay for the head of an academy school is £110,000 a year. Starting. Starting. Um, some of them have salaries in excess of two hundred thousand pounds a year, and this is this is seen to represent the key role that they have as leaders of their business. Um, and now we have also we have uh, groups of schools, academies, uh, in what are called multi-academy trust, MATS, 
and, and these mats have executive head teachers who are responsible for several schools. Uh, the largest mats have over 30 schools. Some mats are just two or five schools. Um, and in all of this, the, the head teacher is, is a key actor. Essentially, the head teacher is the chief executive who has both financial responsibilities, although they have financial staff now who work for them. So the school manager uh, is now a key actor. It didn't exist uh, prior to the time of my policy for school. Uh, but then now um, key actors. Um, so this again, this, this, this remaking of the head teacher of the school director of the principal has implications in terms of their relationship to the, uh, to the teacher um, and who can speak for the school. Um, I, I'm writing a paper with a couple of Australian colleagues at the moment which is based on interviews with some academy head teachers. Um, and in the latest draft of the paper which they've written together, they, they, they talk about these head teachers, I quote a couple of as I finish in a moment, um, uh, talking about my school. Um, my school this, my school that. And as I was reading it, and when I wrote back about the last issue, last um, uh, draft, I, I said to them, D don't we need to problematise this? Who, who, how, how, how is it they are claiming and speaking for their school? What about the teachers? Don't we need to say something about the epistemic injustice of all this, whereby the teacher's voice is silenced and it is the, the school principal, the director, who speaks for the school, my school, as they say, which I, I'll show you. Anyway, I'm waiting for them to get back to me on that. <laughs> so um, so I'll, I'll, I'll try to draw this to a close. So, one of the things I, I, I then thought about was that the mi micropolitics, in a sense, is an exercise in epistemic justice. Uh, it's based upon data drawn from teachers' immediate experiences of organisational life, as it says. So what I, what I actually try and do in, in the book is, is to give voice to teachers or to recognise the teacher's voice. Uh, but also, as I say, and, and this, these two things relate to more recent preoccupations, the book is, in doing that, it's not simply a reversion to the primacy of agency. I was surprised I wrote this, I, but please. Um, <laughs> but rather maintaining the elements of choice, doubt, strategy, planning, error, and transformation, quoting Bob Connell. Um, and that's exactly the, 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 the thing that I say in using different language in, in the book written with Meg McGuire and Annette Braun called How Schools Do Policy. Um, we try to art, uh, articulate, um, develop some theoretical ideas I've been playing with since, since the early 1990s around text and discourse, where text represents the interpretive opportunities that teachers have to make sense of policy, and discourse represents the, the limits to that possibility in terms of how policy may be thought about and spoken of. Um, so at the end of the micropolitics of school there seemed to be a gesture in slightly different language, towards this distinction between policy as text, policy as discourse, between the idea of um, agency, although I wouldn't use that term now, um, and, uh, and control. So the book talks about the relationship between conflict and, and domination. Um, so this again would parallel what I would now talk about as, as text and, and discourse. Um, so it says in the book that conflict and the focus on conflict and domination um, to achieve and maintain particular definitions of the school over and against alternative assertive definitions, I mine, might now might say that policy discourses and related technologies mobilise truth claims and constitute rather than reflect social reality. So these are assertive um, discursive truths about the nature of school reality. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to stop, but it was the, the one thing I, in all this I haven't talked about, um, partly because I've written about it ad nauseum um, over the last uh, uh, 15 years, is, is the role of performativity in this shift and re remaking of the teacher. The role of measurement, monitoring, comparison, benchmarks, tests, targets, etc. 
as ways to um, monitor, organise and drive the education system, which itself is part of this package of the shift of the relationship of state to schools in terms of a move from direct delivery towards contracting, uh, uh, monitoring and, and strategies and tactics of performance management. Um, and of course this, this has an immediate impact on teachers in all sorts of ways. It's a very visceral uh, technology um, which uh, acts very directly on the experience, on the emotions, of the social relations of the personal lives uh, of teachers. Um, and re-articulates their practice in terms of outputs and exchanges. It commodifies their practice, it commodifies them as social actors. It's neoliberalism in the head uh, and in the soul. This is, this is neoliberalism with a small N as against the neoliberal uh, economic structures uh, that we um, confront in, in, in the economy and in the marketplace, neoliberalism neoliberalism with a big uh, M. So when you put together calculation, uh, measurement, with silence, uh, then perhaps we get something like some sort of subjective alienation of teachers or, or, or uh, ontological insecurity, uh, not knowing any longer who one is. Although I was talking to one of my younger colleagues at um, a couple of months ago at UCL um, about my own subject of alienation in higher education. Um, often now, when I, I don't go that often, but when I do go um, to Institute of Education, I, I, I have the sense I'm in an episode of Star Trek <laughs> and I've landed on an alien planet. It kind of looks familiar, but it's not right and I don't belong there. Uh, I feel like an, an, an alien in my own institution. It's, it's all changed. And we were talking about this, and I was talking about my own subjective alienation, and she said, well, yeah, I can understand all that, but this is all I've known. Her experience of higher education was the one that was so alienating for me, but it was the only one she, she, she knew. So her experience is not articulated in exactly the same way. Um, but for many teachers, um, now the, the, the effect of all this is um, uh, a sense of feeling un undervalued, uh, uh, overworked, uh, stressed, uh, powerless. Um, and one effect of this in, in England is um, it's becoming increasingly difficult to recruit teachers. Young people don't want to be teachers. Um, so this 2016, 10.4% of secondary school workforce left in that year. One in ten all teachers left. Um, the number going out of service, not retiring, uh, was up to 34,000. And, it, and it, it's, it's continued beyond that. This is one of the academy head teachers we interviewed. It's frightening that about 40% of newly qualified teachers leave the profession within five years. So by the end of five years, almost half of them have gone. They, could, they, they, they don't want to do it anymore. They're burnt out, stressed, alienated. Uh, there are not enough teachers coming into the profession. They're, they're increasingly difficult to recruit new teachers in relation to leaving the profession. I do 17 plus hour weeks, but teachers who are main scale will completely do 55, 60 hours a week. I actually think we're now at a tipping point because if something isn't done soon, then actually my children's children, I'm not sure who will teach them. It's reached the point that the pressures and the accountability, particularly with OSTED, that's the Office for Standards in Education, is not worth it increasingly for an increase increasingly for an increasing majority of people. Teachers are saying it's not worth it, it's not worth the stress, it's not worth putting up with. Um, and a number another another one of the uh, head teachers this is from another piece of research um, uh, captures this very interestingly. He says, the effects are dire, harming the real job. And the idea of the real job is quite interesting, I think, because he's holding on to this notion that there is something else about teaching that is, is, is the real job, which is not now possible, which is, is not now being enacted. Um, and this is undermining confidence in the service. And that's, that's crisis and silencing. So parents are at our throats. 
They don't trust us anymore. So they're confused by a mismatch of rhetoric, reality and expectation. And here it's ascending into a mire of confusion and despondency. If we, we had more time, I, my, one of my other current arguments and preoccupations about education policy is it's actually absurd. Uh, and I try to talk about the absurdity of policy. We tend to, to look at and use tools which render policy as rational and sensible. We engage with it critically in those terms. But I think we've now got to a point that education policy is actually absurd. And he goes on, the workload, the work overload of drowning in specificatory garbage to irrelevant notions which ever change, which you're damned for the impossibility of keeping up, which confirms a permanent crisis, more in, in improvement, constant need to uh, raise uh, performance, and in, it reinforces testimonial injustice. Dealing with the damage and somehow trying to find a space for real work which they are not the slightest bit interested in, is exhausting. In a sense, as um, Judy Butler puts it, um, teachers are now at a place precisely other to themselves, precisely at the place where they expect to find themselves. Those are my reflections. Michael Partips in the school. Mm -hmm. 32 years.